you're a history professor, an academic. Your first book uh, was uh, off, uh, Against Wind and Tide, the mm -hmm. African-American Struggle Against the Colonization Movement. So you're used to writing about fact, right? Mm -hmm. But you've had this secret for a long time, which is the love of fiction writing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and when you tell fellow academics about that, do they say, what? Or do they say, oh, yeah, me too? So I don't know if, I, mean, I know people here are academics, but those who are not, uh, are not aware of this, but um, there is a little sense of like art and academic divide in universities and sort of cultures, institutional cultures. Um, and so when I chose to do a PhD in African American studies with focus on history, that in of itself was like, you're never going to get a job in the history department. You know, you got a PhD in African American studies. People are going to think you're a radical. Um, and so I did it anyway and, and, and was fortunate to, to get a job in Clark's history department. Um, but most of what you know, I do professionally, sort of my day job, is really trying to understand African American history, their experience, uh, you know, sort of like you know, black people's experiences in social and political movements. Um, and so writing fiction uh, was something that I've been doing throughout, and I've written many novels, but I just, it wasn't something that uh, I did professionally, right? It wasn't something that um, was a part of what my role was in, in the academy institution. And so only my friends, uh, I mean, it wasn't like a secret secret, like, because people who know me know I write fiction, um, but it's not something I would ever bring up unless you ask me specifically. Right, uh, and so it did create a little bit of an issue when I, I realized, you know, I had to tell everybody actually at Clark uh, because, as it turned out, you know, the book was coming out, um, and my second academic book was not at press yet. So I was feeling a lot of anxiety about that, uh, and I was really hoping to actually have the academic book out before the novel. Um, but COVID actually changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Uh, it did allow me to, to do some of the work for fiction, you know, sort of the, the novel revising at that point. But in terms of the academic book, uh, it ended up having to, it was delayed. Uh, I did submit it, though. So um, it, it went out uh, in December this year. Well, actually, it went out in September. But then the editors at UNC Press got back to me in December. And so they sent it out. So, so technically, uh, when the Clark University world found out that actually I write fiction, um, I did have my book uh, that was at press, so no one could give me a hard time and be like, oh, <laughs> you've been wasting our money, uh, you know, doing all this research or whatever, meanwhile you're secretly writing fiction, yeah. so. And before we get into, into the current book, the, the novel, I, I want to talk about process a little bit, because mm -hmm. I know people always ask authors yep. about process, and writing nonfiction versus fiction, as mm -hmm. you know, is, is very different. And, and so you have this you know, nonfiction where you're talking about facts, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have fiction where you have this freedom, right? Yep. This, this freedom to go places that you can't go in nonfiction. Yep. Um, but your book, it speaks the truth. So it, yep. it reads like it's, it's real. It is because it is, in a sense, it is yep. real, right? You're, you're telling a story. So talk a little bit about that yeah. process and the difference. Yeah, so I just want to say, and, and I don't know if this is one of the questions you asked, but so I always wrote fiction, by the way. So my first novel I finished in 2001, um, and so I've written four novels. And so I actually always wrote fiction. Historical writing, I pretty much started, like, really, I was a history major as an undergrad. Um, and then when I went to the PhD program in AFM studies and focused on history, I really began to learn the craft of writing history and what that meant. Particularly writing social history, which is a lot of sort of, you know, looking at documents and stories and trying to help, you know, tell a story, like in the case of Against Wind and Tide, um, about a social movement. Black struggle against the colonization movement, how that fit within the context of the abolition movement, um, and so a lot of that book uh, is one where I'm telling stories based on documents and these sorts of things, trying to recreate that. Now, the novels I've written, and particularly this novel, came from research I had been doing around racial violence and white supremacy and sort of the legacy of the Ku Klux Klan. Because in graduate school, I actually studied collective violence uh, with a scholar named John Higginson, uh, whose actual book came out within the last few years on collective violence in South Carolina. Well, actually. Most of it's really now about South Africa, um, but he was working on a project when I studied with them, looking at collective violence during Reconstruction in South Carolina and in South Africa. Um, and so I had training uh, that I utilized studying you know, the Deep South to, that informed a lot of the historical parts of this novel. Now, in terms of process, 
I always, I, I describe historical writing and novel writing as like the opposite. So with historical writing, I'm sort of given a pile of papers and I need to like go through them and like come back and tell you all, like what does it all mean? Like what's the, no one wants to, you know, well, we want to look through 25 boxes of some person that no one knows about. And then, you know, so we go in the room, we look through those boxes, and our task is to come back out and write a book that tells all of you, like, what's significant, right? When I'm writing fiction, it's like the opposite. I have to go within myself and figure out why the voices I hear, the scenes, like, what, and make them coherent and make sense to other people. Because when I see them, when I'm working on this novel, I'm actually a visual writer, so I do see the scenes and I hear the voices which I actually learned when I did my MFA at Columbia that that's not normal. So I was like with other writers, I was like, don't you all like hear voices of your characters? They're like, no, I'm like, okay, so, no, so yeah. Some, some writers do, and, and I, I'm gonna ask you about that because sometimes when yep. you're writing fiction and you have a minor character in your story, that that minor character just won't shut up, right? And that minor Absolutely. character takes on a bigger role yep. and you maybe never meant for that character to have this role, but did, and did that happen to you in this book? 100%, and some of the characters who aren't in the book, <laughs> you know, are probably very sad in the world of characters out there, um, because that's what the editor's for, actually, is to tell you, like, what characters aren't as important. Um, so for me, it's much more of a sort of internal mess, in a sense, and so really I'm trying to, like, go with them, and no one can really help me <laughs> with that. Um, but when, you know, my agent, my editor, they're the ones that look at what I've written down and then sort of, you know, help me really get to what um, we sort of collectively see as the story and the version, et cetera, so. Talk a little bit about the relationship between history and memory. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, so we were having this conversation, and so I teach history, uh, and one of the early lessons I give to my students um, is this idea, we were talking about this earlier at dinner, uh, is that, like, history in some ways is the enemy of memory, right? Because as you remember the events of, for example, the 60s, right? So my dad grew up, you know, during the 60s or 50s, really, and was at um, uh, John C. Smith College in, in Charlotte during the sit-in. So he was like, he sat in, he was involved in the civil rights movement. Um, and one thing that's interesting about memory, and we were, I learned the science earlier, actually, I'm really excited about that, um, is that as I taught the civil rights movement class, things that I told my father about it historically impacted his memory of it. So he would tell me back things later that, um, that, that I, or stuff that I told him from newer scholarship on the civil rights movement. And so it projects on top. Um, but w the reason I say it's the enemy of memory is because of all the times we say to somebody, like when they tell a story and you're like, and you just know it's not true. Like, it's, like it's, parts of it are true, but if you like look at the documents, like that person actually wasn't there and I would get into that with my dad. Like at the meeting at Shaw you're talking about, like that person was at the other meeting. They weren't at that first meeting. And so, in a sense, historians' role as like the, you know, party poopers, <laughs> like, is just be like, actually, uh, that was in 1864, and this is the reason why it's important. So a lot of my, my role as a historian and as a teacher is to help the students, so to understand that you need to, you need to know, it's important to understand and know that in spring 63 is when Martin Luther King had the movement in Birmingham. Because that movement ended up leading to the March on Washington, which is in August 63, right? And then when Four Little Girls are bombed, that's in the fall. Like, that's important to know. It's not just trivia, um, because it's a part of sort of thinking about not only the memory of that sort of moment historically, but the ways in which events shape that. Um, and so, for me, I'm constantly engaged in that process of trying to um, recognize and respect uh, the memories we have about past events, particularly doing contemporary work on like the civil rights movement or 60s and 70s, which by the way, the 70s is a topic now. <laughs> it's scholars are writing about the 80s even. Uh, I know for some of us like, what? That's history? It's like, yeah, actually, that's, you know, it is a part of our recent history. Oh, you're making um, me feel old. Yeah, <laughs> no, it is really like a legitimate, uh, the 70s is absolutely legitimate. Um, but even like the early 80s. Uh, so, so yeah, history and memory really informs all of what I do. And, um, and even in the, in the fictional work, you know, I, I use a lot of memoirs, and we were talking about this earlier with some of the students, like particularly like Angela Davis's memoir and like black activist memoirs in the, in the 60s, and their memories of events. In, in some ways, um, 
you know, really shaped the writing of the book uh, in ways that maybe more so than the history in some senses, because I really was interested in voice, you know, and, you know, that sort of voice that drives really, you know, good, well-edited memoirs. So uh, in your book, uh, The Confessions of Matthew Strong, you choose to tell the story uh, from the perspective of a black woman, a professor of philosophy. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Allie Douglas. Yeah, so, um, so, so, all right, so I'll go backwards in time. So I... I didn't bring it. I should have brought it. I forgot to bring it. But I actually handwrite all my first drafts, right? So I have the actual notebooks from July uh, of 2007 when I started. So I could, you know, sometimes I'll bring them and show people, like, look, this is the Confessions of Matthew Strong, 715, <laughs> right? And you could see it. So that was first blush, like Confessions of Matthew Strong. Um, and me working on this sort of idea of this disgruntled white person who find, you know, finds himself sort of being involved with white supremacist movement to reclaim the South, all that stuff. But in that, those first pages, I knew that my story, that, that this person was like the villain, right? And so I need a hero. And so that's where Allie Douglas emerged. Um, and as one of our perceptive students uh, pointed out, it directly was shaped by Angela Davis, right? So... I was interested in Angela Davis. I had studied Davis's autobiography. I don't know if we've read it. I have my mom's copy, actually. <laughs> I still use when I teach it. Um, and, and so I thought to, like, what better person to be my hero than Angela Davis? Because she's, like, one of my heroes. Uh, and so Allie Douglas is not Angela Davis. There are enough for our perceptive students at Fabeth Academy. <laughs> I'm very proud. Y'all should be very proud. Uh, picked up on the references, but I said that that was the first time anyone's actually ever brought it up with me. It's not that readers didn't notice it, but through the talks I've given, no one's actually explicitly asked me that question. Like, you know, I'm thinking, Allie Douglas really sounds very familiar to Angela Davis. So that was the sort of inspiration because I knew I wanted to, uh, my character as they emerged sort of first blush, this Matthew Strong character, fashioned himself as a philosopher. And so I knew that my hero needed to be a philosopher. And so Angela Davis uh, was a person who I used. But I don't want to freak out Angela Davis in case you would write a blurb and like make it biographical. <laughs> what do we know? So it's actually not Angela Davis. It's Ali Douglas, inspired AD. But Angela. it's definitely inspired by, uh, by Angela Davis. All right. So you are not a woman. Yes. So True. did you find it a challenge to write from a woman's point of view? How did you put your mind into that, and, and I'm yep. imagining you had to have some help somewhere along the line going, oh, yeah, yep, yeah. a woman would never do that or say that, right? Yeah, so I was terrified. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the challenges being a person that hears voices and like my, my process is that that, like the rational, like, okay, how are you going to pull this off part? Um, wasn't in the mix. I wasn't like, okay, I'm going to choose a, you know, a, a heroine and let's, you know, it wasn't like that. It was like, this is what, who the character was. And so the creative problem became like, how is it possible for me to, to write in a way to make some of you who've read it really feel that voice? And so what I tell people is that the, the moment when you're reading, when you stop seeing my face and you see however you describe uh, Allie Douglas, that's when I've succeeded. And so I won't, so I won't know if I did it well, until I come, you know, until you all read it, and you're like, wow, I, I, yeah, this Allie Douglas character is not you, the author, right? And so, and I wrote in first person, so it's like even more challenging, right? Um, and so I was terrified. I was really, really afraid. Um, but I just have a great community of people, and they supported it. And, you know, my mom reads all my stuff. And so, my, and my mom is a Southern black woman. <laughs> and so she was a great first level of, Checking and yeah, no, that you know, no, <laughs> that that wouldn't work. And so I did have have that from from the beginning. Um, and then my agent uh, Sarah is fantastic, and she's from the south, from Georgia. Um, and so uh, I had her. And then my editor was a woman. My publisher. I had a lot of women yeah, before y'all well, read it to there, try yeah. to. And, and that's the thing. The editor. So Sarah, my agent, was the editor first, and then she jumped ship and became an agent. And so editors. They're like master readers, and, and some of us may be editors, so y'all can talk about your experiences, but they are searching for the contradictions, right? They're like looking for what's going to distract the reader, you know, by, by being off, you know, just some illusion or something I said that, 
just felt like a, a woman wouldn't say that in you know, a very gendered way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so that's, that's what made it sort of possible. So I can't do the, I don't do the lone artist thing. Like I get that and some of you artists, that's totally fine, but I just, that's just not me. I'm a person who's community and I'm inspired. But on a, on a, for those who are writers here, it's reading those memoirs and really studying like the writing and like how, what they're talking about. And you know, that's what maybe also gave it a sense of authenticity mm -hmm. because it very much, uh, was influenced by the the, um, the memoirs I read and and also the interviews. You know, Eyes on the Prize I show all the time, and um, you know the segments on Alabama and listening to a lot of voices of Black women in the South. Um, you know, in that time period, uh, informed like her grandmother and the sister. There's actually a lot of main characters. It's told through Allie, but um, to try to to try to get it well. So when I went on tour in the South, and I had these like really super smart young Black women interviewing me. You know, it's like, oh, like, oh my gosh. And then, you know, and, and a few of them really said, like from Alabama, were like, oh, you know, this is really love the novel and love the character. And, and, like, <laughs> and it's not over yet. Some of y'all read it and be like, you totally failed. And I might, you know, for some people it just doesn't work. Um, but at least so far, uh, the feedback has been really positive mm -hmm. around, around yeah. that. And so. you mentioned uh, writing in first person, yeah. which has its limitation as we Absolutely. only see her perspective. So talk about that challenge. Yeah, I had a friend who I haven't talked to in like 30 years. So I was an athlete growing up. Or, you know, I wasn't really super into school or writing. Um, so one of my like athlete coach friends uh, read the novel. I hadn't talked to him in like 20 years. It was so cool. And he's like, the only problem with the novel is like, I just don't get, like, you left so many things unfigured out, like undeveloped. Like, what happened here? And whatever happened with this? So when you write in first person, like, that's the challenge, right? That you only know what Allie knows, right? So if Allie doesn't know how it was resolved, she's telling us the story. And so what that means is that you're not able, I mean, you can always put in, like, oh, and then I found, which I actually do a few times in the novel, but because, like, sometimes it is needed to sort of, like, explain certain aspects of the broader white supremacist movement that Allie wouldn't have known, mm -hmm. right? But she's telling you now. And she knows certain things, like, oh, it turned out that that couple was a part of this whole thing, and that feels authentic. But if you start doing that for everything, all the subplots, it'll feel like you're doing a summary of the subplots. Um, and so you have to leave them. And so, um, so that's the challenge and the choice of doing first person. That's the challenge, is that you ultimately can only know what the character knows. Are your other novels written in first person? So I've written, let's say, I wrote, th so Talent has one third person and two first persons. It's three different people. Um, I have uh, Black as in third person, which I switched to first person, but I think I'm gonna go back to third person. Um, and my other novel, A New American Story, is third person. Wow, okay. So. Um, so you start the book with Matthew Strong's voice. Yes. Which is really key, right? Because yep. you, you wanna set up who this guy is, although we don't really learn a lot about him, but there's, um, like a, a, a creepiness to it, right? So what are you trying to convey there yeah. in that very beginning? Yeah, no, I'm really glad you asked that. So those of us who are playwrights in here, I don't know if you're, so I knew I needed Matthew Strong on stage early because he's in a really important character. But the way I wrote the book, there's really not an opportunity so much, even on the early scene we sort of meet him, um, to give us a sense, like a prologue to what's happening. And so I actually wrote that really early. And that voice of Matthew Strong, and it's a, it's a sort of, it's, a, it's, a not, it's not a conventional, it's an unconventional style of writing, where a character is speaking to somebody else, but you don't hear what their response is. And it's not super conventional, um, and my agent <laughs> was like, I just don't get this, it just doesn't work. And so I took it out forever, um, because I was like, you know what, you know, it changes the book over time. And I was like, you know what? Um, but then at the end, I was like, you know, I just went back and I was like, all right, no. Um, even if it's weird and maybe throws people off because it, it's a very, de you know, those who heard the audio apparently, I can't listen to the audio. Um, but like those who heard the audio, like they're like, what's happening? Like that's the voice is so creepy. And, it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that worked. Like I'm so happy because <laughs> it's really sort of experimental. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm really glad that it well, had the effect are, of creepiness. You're asking yourself, what the heck is going on? Did everybody else find that creepy? Who People read the book, read right? It. You're going like, ooh, this is this guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so that's yeah. the, the thing. Once again, it's like an experimental thing that if you all felt creeped out, like that was the purpose, 
Um, but just the style, you just don't know if people connect with it. If they're just like, this is weird. Like, I don't want to read the rest of the book because it just is like too disembodied you know, and strange. You want to find out what, what's going on, right? Um, would you say fear is at the basis of this story and, and confronting yeah. that fear? Yeah, very much so. So, you know, my idea for the novel was this basic sort of question um, that is very historic, right? So how do black communities respond to existential threats to the black community, right? So the founding sort of idea, so Matthew Strong is representative of this like very personified but person literally, uh, you know, external threat, right? He's kidnapping black women in this community and it's a part of this bigger conspiracy and plan to erect terror in the black community, right? And we know historically that, well that's true, there's been people and they sadly continue to do acts, going into churches and like killing people and assassinating state senators. Like, I mean, these are intentional acts of terror, right? Um, you know, in the most pure form. And so, um, you know, as I thought about the story and I sort of built it out and really, I realized, right, that, that really that's what the story was about. You know, it wasn't about Matthew Strong, right? It's really about a black community and how Allie Douglas finds herself back in her community um, and when she's there, how she sort of comes to consciousness around like their efforts to protect their community and figure out what's happening. Um, and so it is a novel that's rooted in fear, my own fear. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned sort of in the end, you know, for me, and I don't know people's age, but like the Atlanta child murders was like the most terrifying thing in the 80s for me because it was like the first time in my life as a young person that, because those rumors, there was like racial killings going on in Atlanta. Turns out like they convicted Wayne Williams. They actually reopened the case up, by the way. So, because a lot of people were like, I just don't feel like Wayne Williams, you know, this black person actually was convicted of killing these like 19 or 20, you know, black, you know, youth. Um, and so as a kid, it was the first time I really thought like, wait, people could be killed because they're black? Like I hadn't, it really had, even though I sort of was born in Harlem and I grew up in a predominantly white community, I just didn't have a moment like that, um, you know, where I really saw that. And so for me, writing this novel was absolutely a journey back into that fear um, and trying to capture that fear in a you know, different context, different place, different setting. I mean, there's, you know, mention of it in the novel and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, fear was really, and that's hard because, you know, I, saw, I was talking to students about writing and, and I said that historical writing in some ways, it's a little easier because you can have that authoritative voice and like you're the historian and that. Um, and writing fiction is like me diving into my own fear and it's just vulnerable. Like I just, you know, it's creepy, it's vulnerable. I have to re, you know, sort of access, you know, that fear to try to make it realistic. Um, because that's, yeah, that's the real thing, so, yeah. yeah. I, I saw an interview, and I think, was it your mother who said, let your faith be stronger than your fear? That's on my mother's wall, in her room. And so that ended up in the novel. A lot of things like that are just throwaways. It's so funny, the first person to ask about that. But it, it actually, so, you know, I had, you know, written the novel, and, you know, I'm working on their drafts. And when I saw that on, like, a little thing, my mom, you know, church every Sunday, you know, really super, super religious. I mean, I go, I try to go as much as I can. <laughs> um, I'm a Christian, and I, I try to go to church. But she has that on her wall, and I really felt like that, like, was really important. Like, that idea, because I already, those, you know, we know Kierkegaard, Leap of Faith, and sort of, like, this idea of, you know, part of, like, connecting religions, you have to have this, the argument is a leap of faith, right? That there's something else that you have to have. And so that had already been influential to me in thinking about this work and why we do what we do in social movements and why we think, there could be an end and something positive. Um, and so when I saw that little quote, she has a lot of those, I was like, I was like, this is it. Like, this is it. You know, like, this is exactly that, that question. Um, so I do believe that, though. Yeah. You explore finding empathy in yep. a terrible situation. I wonder if you talk about the difference between empathy and sympathy. Yeah, so I've been really interested in sort of this concept of empathy and sympathy. Um, and when I think of empathy and how I think it plays out um, in, the, in the book, um, it has to be with a deeper connection around something that happens as opposed to being sympathetic, like, oh, that's so sad that happened. But it's, to me, a deeper connection with something that's happened to somebody, being empathetic. Um, you know, similar to sort of like putting yourself in someone else's shoes and it's a layer deeper and oftentimes in, in black social political movements, 
um, those who sort of felt, this goes back to this question about allyship, some people see being sympathetic as, you know, congratulate yourself, you're sympathetic. Um, and so I was very interested in that question around this moment um, and, the, and the ways in which actually in the 60s, you know, when you have, uh, you know, black women particularly, and finally some white women who become involved in, in the movement, you know, in Birmingham, for example, uh, really being forced to, to empathize with this as opposed to just seeing it as something that they're sympathetic oh, of the plight of black women, say, in Montgomery, uh, you know, who are discriminated on the buses. Um, and so for me, that became another sort of sub-theme, not even a theme, but just a concept. You know, it's a, she's a philosopher, right? So I'm like, <laughs> you know, choosing different elements uh, that are important that philosophers bring up. And I have a colleague who was a retired philosopher who taught with me in this adult education program I teach in. And, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I gave her a draft of the book, and I was terrified. I was like, oh, my God, this is like a professional philosopher. I'm like, um, and, and she read it, and we talked, and, like, I just took notes. And she just made me sound so smart. <laughs> she was, like, talking about all the philosophical principles that, from my reading, and, you know, Davis and others sort of ended up being in there, showing up, about body consciousness. And, like, I was just like... Wow, I wish I had those notes here right now. I can get it to you all, but but yeah. So so as a philosopher, that these are sort of questions around sympathy and empathy, and that are sort of important in psychology and philosophy. So and of course, your book is fiction. Yep. Yet there are similarities to real life events, um, and it's almost like you you started this. What, 2007, did you say? Yeah. So it's almost like you're looking in a crystal ball in some ways. And I think your agent was even saying that to you. Like, like yeah. what? You know, uh, uh, so yeah. what are your thoughts as, as you watch some real events unfold that have, have so many similarities to this story that's fictional? Yes. Yeah, so when I, when I started working on this novel, so, you know, President, you know, Barack Obama was elected president, right? So very much in my head originally, like original concept was like getting me to think about for some people how much this seems like the end of something. Like, wow, like this person, like a black person has been present and how disruptive it is. There's a, a, a book about the civil rights movement uh, by um, a guy named Jason Sokol called There Goes My Everything. And it's like white Southerners' response to, to you know, sort of civil rights movement and something like that as a subtitle. And you know, Sokol's work, um, uh, there's a, a, another scholar who wrote a book Strangers in Their Own Land. I'm blanking on it. She won the Pulitzer in like 99. But there were works that really got at this sort of question that I ended up raising with my character, right? This sort of like, you know, and the ultimate example being, you know, the president. Uh, like. So that was the start. That was when I started the book. Um, and so I, there was a church that was burned in Springfield, Mass, uh, where I, you know, near where I live. Uh, and, and that also was like, wow, like people are like burning churches in, and they got caught, and they're doing federal, you know, did 10 years in federal prison. Um, but that idea of, like, what that really meant to certain people and their acts of violence in response to it was very much influential in terms of my thinking about it. And so as sort of time went on, you know, and as I was working on it, part of the subplot is Matthew Strong is trying to motivate insurrection. And when I was working on it, I was like, people aren't going to think it's realistic. I'm like, they're going to be like, come on, this one, like... You're, you're, you know, like really, like people would think they can overthrow the government. And so, as it turns out, uh, apparently, you know, that fictive, so no, I had no crystal ball, but, you know, as I begin to develop the character, I sort of know the history of, of the sort of, you know, white power movement and the sort of anti-government movement and, and these sorts of things. Like, you know, and it, you know, it was something that people actually thought they could pull off. So, um, so that's like one example. You know, there's other examples in there. I mean, when I went to Georgia and Herschel Walker was running for Senate, and you know my, the, my so I was in a book and she was like, I can't believe it, like in your novel, because my novel, like you know, my black character is like an ex football you know player who's running for governor, and so there's like and he's a Republican character in my novel, and um, so there are more examples, but there are these examples of things that really ended up sort of happening uh, that were really strange intersections. But no, I have no, like, I, it's just imagination uh, <laughs> rooted in stuff that's happened in the past. Like, nothing's, like, that far, although I take it over the government. I, was like, mm -hmm. I think that's pretty, whew, imagination. Talk about the imagination. But, um, yeah. so anyway, yeah. Talk about the juxtaposition between, you have Allie working, you know, in the, this academic setting in the Northeast mm -hmm. where I think, 
um, in real life, people of color working in that, yes. that situation uh, have microaggressions all the time, yep. right? And then, that, and then you have the Deep South with the, with the roots in, in white supremacy. And I, I, another interview I saw that you mentioned this, and I yep. thought, wow, this is a great thing to bring up. Uh, you mentioned Malcolm X yep. and his quote, Mississippi is anywhere south of the Canadian border. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's a classic <laughs> one. And actually, so... Um, Mary Ann Shad Carey is a black woman abolitionist and activist in the 1850s who wrote a book, um, uh, you know, uh, about Canada West. And so she is an immigration issue. So she actually was the first one in that book, actually, to talk about, like, you think you can escape slavery? Like, the whole United States is a place where the slaveholders can go. So actually, a black woman intellectual uh, is actually the person who for me at least, really wrote about that as a part of like of reimagining America beyond geographical borders like north, south, slaveholding, non-slaveholding. Um, but Malcolm very famously sort of made this critique. Um, and you know, it sort of influenced uh, you know, the just sort of my ideas about trying to help people, even though the novel completely reinforces that, even though my civil rights movement class, I'm like constantly challenging that binary. Um, when I decided to make my character from Alabama and the whole thing, I couldn't really go off of it. Um, but, you know, her being a black woman philosopher, uh, which there is, you know, not that many black women professionally philosophers, um, she's at a university, uh, and, you know, she sort of narrates for, for some people who are shocked uh, the experience of what it means to be sort of a black woman you know, academic, or also, in her case, sort of be a philosopher. And so I have heard from other black philosophers, or not philosophers, but academics, that I, like, nailed that. I was like, well, given the fact that I'm a black academic in a predominantly white school. Um, but so it, it's interesting that they did give voice to some people, because I'm not sure how comfortable, um, you know, black academics are at being critical of the president of the university, or of the provost, or the way they're utilized, and how they're envisioned, or the way in which, uh, in sort of predominantly white departments, uh, the ways in which senior colleagues talk to you in ways that they don't see as problematic at all, that like most people would look at each other and be like, and it's just totally gender too. One of my colleagues who was the first woman who was, she just retired actually uh, in the department. She always told the story about how when she first got hired at Clark, you know, one of these senior scholars like handed her these papers, like I need 25 copies of these papers. You know what I mean? She was like, I am a professor, I am not the secretary. Like, she's over there, right? So these ways in which gender and race play themselves out aren't surprising to those who are minorities or women or whatever. Um, but I think that sometimes, and in my case in the book, I gave voice to that a bit, um, had some fun with it a bit. And as it turns out, the president of the university actually loved the book, and <laughs> he talks about it. Like, the State of the Union address, he was like, you know, and we have this guy. So he does a State of the you know, State of the Union sort of each in the semester. He's like, this scholar is like doing their work on global warming in Mexico and how important it is this. And then Usman Paragreen writing a novel. I'm like, okay, like I guess I'm like, I guess the novel's up there with global warming. I just sort of laughed. I was like, I don't think so. But um but yeah, it's really he's very receptive of it. And you know, I don't there's no like actual universe. I took out all any universe. I tried to there are little mentions to like Faneuil University in Boston. Um, so there are little drops, but I, I tried to, Christopher Columbus University in New York City. Um, so there are mentions of actual, but they're not actual universities. Um, but at the same time, that is something that is very true. And, you know, I, I didn't think it'd be that controversial, but people did bring it up right away, and I was like, oh, okay. Like, that was nothing to do with that, but, you know, if that's something that you grabbed onto and you find interesting and compelling, that's great, so. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we talk about the experiences that, uh, in real life experiences, I mean, you're writing fictional, but it does bring back, yeah. uh, you know, memories and stories and trauma. So how we pass down these stories yeah without creating fear or trauma, yep. and can we, can we do that? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, I don't know the answer. Um, some people in here actually are scientists, maybe would help us more <laughs> the answer to that, like literally. Um, but I know that in our families, for example, we have stories that, um, you know, we hear in passing, and sometimes we push it, and we're like, hey, what's that? Like, you mentioned something, but what was that about? Um, and oftentimes, like in my family, for example, you know, they, you know, a story that my grandfather told 
me, he was like 92, and we went down, he'd been moved to Virginia, because my, my aunt lived in Virginia, about my grandmother, uh, who was from Alabama, right? And she had passed away in the 90s, and he, he's like literally he had cancer, and he was, you know, sort of in hospice, and he told me the story about how my, it would be my great-grandfather was almost lynched in Alabama, and that's what led them to move to New York. Now, my grandmother never told that story to me, you know, and I was pretty close to my grandmother, and she never told that. Um, and so it made me really think when I was working on this book, and it becomes sort of an important sort of piece about it in terms of Allie and her grandmother about like what story, like how we try to protect our children from the past by not telling them things. And the question is like, does that protect, like, you know, what role does that actually play, uh, you know, in not telling these stories that are just a part of our family history and our, you know, so we never talk to anyone in Alabama side of the family. So that would be like the fourth, you know, so I have, you know, two grandmothers, two grandfathers, and like that side of the family, like we never talked about, we never connected with. It was like that complete side of the family was, you know, and I didn't even learn much about the side of the family until after that. And my aunt, um, you know, sort of did some little research about that. So um, I brought my daughter and I wrote an essay, I was asked to sort of write an essay about it to, uh, Alabama uh, last summer to go and search for these great, you know, slaveholding graveyards. And, you know, real fun trip, Dad. Like, go find. We're gonna search for plantation homes and and cemeteries. Like, you in? Um, and I mean, you know, what are you gonna do? You know, I was a historian, so we like weird stuff like that. Um, but uh, you know, it really so. I was really reflecting. So when I wrote a, this personal essay about this, I was reflecting on to what degree I wanted to sort of tell her about that and not like terrify her. Like we're going to Alabama, you know, and like I don't want to project onto her like sort of like that history of racial violence and she's already like sort of a scared kid anyway. But um, I really didn't want to project that on her but I just had to sort of wrestle with that. I mean, I told her, you know, she knows but it's one of those things where like, do we go searching for that place, for example? Mm. Like where was that? Uh, and. And that's where I feel like it's really challenging. And I don't know, so that's why I said I don't know the answer to it. Like, and I just feel like we all, as parents and grandparents and siblings and cousins, have to sort of wrestle with that sense of are we letting go of a past? And like, you know, do we really want to know about our parents, you know, that uh, you know, our great grandparents that immigrated from whatever country, for example? You know, you know, I remember my minister saying that she, her, she had traced her family back to Scotland, but and then she, it turned out that like, her like great 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 was like convicted of this crime. It was like horrifying, and that's why he fled to the United States. <laughs> like, yeah, like you go dig in the past, and sometimes you do find out things. It's not glorious and wonderful, um, and he had done like something really bad, and um, and so that is a reality. And so I think that that really plays into a lot of my thinking about this. So, the book has gotten a lot of great reviews, and I wonder. I mean, like. I always wonder if authors are like really nervous about that when the book yeah. comes out and like, do you even look at them? Yeah. So, so my, my novel was, was uh, reviewed in the New York Times. Um, and I don't know if we're writers or if we know like that that's like seen as like, you know, winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, what? Because it's just so hard to be reviewed in the New York Times. I mean, it's the biggest circulation of I think it's still the biggest circulation of newspapers. Um, and so if your work is, is reviewed in the New York Times, it's like, you know, seen as, uh, you know, the, 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 the top that you can, and you can't control that, right? So it's something that you just dream of. And, and so when people would ask me about that, like, oh, you know, maybe it'll be, you know, reviewed in the New York Times. And I thought to myself, and I used to say, like, you want it reviewed in the Times positively. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's a little caveat there. Like, everyone, you know, it's like, yeah, I dreamed of it being reviewed in the New York Times, but I was terrified that it gets slammed, right? Mm -hmm. Some brilliant author you know, who, you know, writes on Alabama history or whatever would be like, and show, all, show the entire world all of what's bad in it. So I was terrified, actually. Um, even when my, my, um, my publicist said, like, don't get your hopes up. But there is a chance it's going to be published in the New York Times. Like, the review, this review is going to be done. Um, I was like, 
terrified. I was like, okay, my hopes aren't up, and I'm also now really afraid, right? Because, you know, um, yeah, it's a very public shaming, you know, when you get slammed in the New York Times. Uh, but the review is, you know, generally really positive. I really felt like the reviewer got the book and saw what I was trying to do and didn't, like, search online too much about me and, like, slam me personally, <laughs> which sometimes you read in these reviews. You're like, what are they talking about? They're, like, slamming the author, not the actual work. Um, so I was very afraid of that. Uh, and then NPR and just some of the other... You know, NPR, and again, I, there's no reason y'all should know this. But NPR like, audience, they're readers. So that's yeah, NPR is incredible. <laughs> but on so Christmas morning, they chose five, or I think four books or five books from their best of series to like, to like to talk about. And mine was one of them. So like someone, like, oh my gosh, I just heard you on NPR this morning, like of all mornings. And so I just was, you know, and it was a, it was a journalist from Alabama, who had read it and she chose to do this like three minute, each one like took a, you know, cho chose a book and yeah, I was, you know, so excited, you know, but yeah, but pretty much terrified. Happy day, yeah. yeah, happy, so, but pretty much terrified. So what do you hope people, readers take away from your book? What do you hope they walk away with? You know, I, I don't, I don't have a singular thing for them to take away. You know, I'd mentioned this, you know, some of the students had asked me about this similar sort of question. And, you know, my view is that, and this is the difference between my view about art and academic. When you write an academic book and you write scholarship, that is literally intended to go out to people, to review, to critique, to be engaged in a conversation. When you're an artist, you have to let it go. You can't editorialize. You know, what I'm doing right now, like, you know, it's after the fact maybe, but, you know, really, it's, we're well, supposed to let the art speak for itself. And if you do too much, which I've already done, by the way, if you do too <laughs> much what I just spent the last whatever time doing, it impacts people's reading experience. And so what I, I don't really have, if people read this from beginning to end, like, wow, thank you. Even if you, like, I read it, I hated it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you read it? Like, that's my <laughs> response. Because what do we do with things we don't like? We just, like, take a bite. And we're like, that's terrible. We don't eat it, right? We don't get a second chance. And same thing with reading. Like, you pick up the book, you read five pages, I hate it. You watch the show, you turn it off. Um, and so for me, if readers read it and take something from it um, that's positive, not like, Wow, Matthew Strong's vision is really you know, like, you know, hopefully it's enough of a critique, I guess, on some level, and we see the black community come together. So I guess I could say what I don't want people to take away, um, uh, but but definitely, I guess to to be more direct, I mean, it is a book about black community coming together. You know, when you know when there's a threat to the community, you know, black historically black people haven't been able to rely on the police, for example or the FBI, for example. They've had to come together themselves and, and figure out what's going on on a micro level and then on a broader level. And in my novel, that's the case. You know, I tried not to like be negative toward, I mean, I have nothing against police, FBI, like I know people in those things, uh, law enforcement um, at all, no critique. Um, this is a novel about Alabama, and in this context, this is the circumstance. And, and though in my, you know, those who read the novel know that there is a, I don't even know if it's a critique as much as it's something I have heard um, you, know, you know, white police officers who've been involved in them say about their efforts. And there is a critique in there with the characters, but no bigger critique. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, eager to, to sort of see you know, and keep learning from readers about what they sort of take, took from the book and what's interesting to them. Um, because, you know, I think it's all interesting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, all my drafts I think are interesting. And the editor's like, yeah, no. Like, and no. Um, but for me, I've been in this world for 15 years. And, you know, Ali Douglas's world and Matthew Strong's world. Um, and uh, I'm just excited that, you know, that people read it and that they found it to be so interesting to them. Because, you know, as I said, you know, getting reviewed, getting blurbs. You all know how blurbs work at all? Or... You, know, you sort of reach out to these authors and ask, hey, listen, you know, Angela Davis, like, will you write about my book? <laughs> <laughs> and you wait, check your email, and after a couple weeks, you're like, yeah, I don't think she's getting back to me. And, ah, darn. No, because I met, I met Angela Davis twice. And so I was like, I met you twice. <laughs> Please give it a shot. So I was be like, I just got to send one more email. <laughs> like, the third one she'll reply, but she didn't reply. But that's all good. Um, so anyway. How about questions from the audience? Yeah. Anybody have a question or, or comments thought? too, yeah. or long okay. diatribes? And, yeah, if you could speak really <laughs> Anything loud. Anything is I, fine. I'm going to repeat the question so that everybody can hear it.
So the question, wow. the question is, he knows historians, and uh, none that you know of writing fiction, you wondered if they might follow in your footsteps. So maybe the historians you know don't publish their fiction. Um, I did not publish my fiction. I still have more fiction to publish. Um, I don't, I, I really, and I know people are like, Usman, you're just so paranoid. But I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, historians are writers. They're storytellers. That's what they do. So they're writing stories all the time. Um, you know, do they find, some people like say like, oh, like historical fiction. I'm like, I mean, I don't think it's historical fiction because usually historical fiction is actually about a real person. Do you know what I mean? Or a real event, World War II, Vietnam War, you know, where my events are fictional, um, even though some of them are getting close to real. Um, and so I technically don't feel like it's historical fiction, um, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure if the culture of like historical profession, how much they'll embrace scholars who are historians who also write fiction. At the same time, like, I don't know, maybe once more people do, then it won't be such a dividing line over scholars who critique fiction and write history books about historical events. Um, but um, Annette Gordon-Reed uh, in the Monticellos, I don't know if people have read that sort of Pulitzer Prize, where it won every award, super, and Sally Hemings. And, but the one about the family, in her intro really inspired me. Um, and I got a chance to meet her because she was like a person at uh, Clark's commencement. She was given an honorary degree. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm about to meet Anna, Annette Gordon-Reed. But she actually, in her intro, talks about the role of imagination in historical writing. And I really appreciate that. <laughs> you know, and, and, just, and she, she says, like, you know, for me to create this world for you, you know, about this family of, you know, you know, enslaved people, and we don't have that much evidence, I have to use my imagination, right? The, the facts or the evidence only takes me so far. So I'm making these sort of, I'm using my imagination rooted in, you know, the facts about, and given other circumstances about what happened. Uh, and I really appreciate that um, because it's true. We are making an argument about the events and why they happened and how they happened. And other historians come along and they're like, actually, I have evidence that says that's not the case. You know, we have to be humble and, okay, wow, I didn't know that, and share the resources. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, I'm not sure, but, you know, and I haven't got that much really pushback. Like, my mentor, who's a historian, she was so proud of me. Like, I, of course, didn't tell her either, so she had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> she was like, and then my editor in UNC Press, uh, she actually was an undergrad at Clark, which is a total coincidence. And then so she gets the alumni newsletter. And so when this whole thing came out, she sent me an email in all caps. Because she had my histor historical book, like I sent it to her in September. She wrote, you wrote a novel? Exclamation for exclamation. <laughs> and she's like the editor at USC Press, the senior editor of the history part, right? Yeah. And so she was thrilled. And she was like, wow, that's incredible. And she was proud of me. Mm -hmm. And my mentor, Manisha Sina, who um, is a you know, historian, a very... A renowned historian, the abolition movement. You know, she was so proud of me. Oh, Luz wrote a novel and put it on your CV. And I was like, I'm not putting it on my CV. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I literally am like, not putting it on my You just said CV. something in that so. answer that maybe they don't tell people about it. And you said yeah. you have more novels. The novels that you wrote yeah. before this, none of them were published. Mm -hmm. So. Are you not planning yet. on publishing? Something? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have to like stop myself from new projects, and turn backwards. And so I think. It sort of is up to my publisher and my agent, but so I wrote a novel. Do you guys, anyone ever read Richard Wright's Native Son? You guys read that? So I, one of my novels called New American Story is a rewrite of that novel uh, set in New York now. Um, and I love, I love all my novels. I don't know if we're parents in here, but it's like we love all of our children the same, right? It's like that one's a little annoying, but I love them the same. And so, um, so I, I really feel like that might be the one that I should publish next. Mm -hmm. I, the other novel that probably will, might be published next, because it's sort of like, you know, my agent was like, oh, that sounds so interesting. She was super into it. Is, uh, it's called Black, and it's about this character. It's sort of based on like Malcolm X and Fred Hampton, who's assassinated in the 60s. Um, when the novel opens up, the main character is this, this PhD student who's a political scientist who's very conservative. And he writes a dissertation that's a critique of this character, Thomas Black. And it turns out that black might be alive. 
And so the novel takes you on this journey for him to figure out, like, is this person who everyone thought the building blew up and, like, with all, like, the, their organization, like, if they're still alive. And, and so it sort of takes you on a reverse slave narrative. It's all the literary people and English professors. Like, it's like a reverse <laughs> slave narrative. And it goes backwards to the South and the Caribbean and then with the West Africa. Well, I'm not going to tell you if he's still alive. We've got to wait. But you got to read the novel. But, like, you know, there's evidence that, like, from the 80s, there's letters. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like, oh, like, maybe he survived it. But, like, there's no sense that now, like, he literally would be still alive. And so um, so my agent really likes that novel. Uh, and so maybe that won't be next. So. How about any other? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Jerry. Yep. And, and at the same time, you said that you read a lot of memoir. And yep. I think you talk a little about memoir because it strikes me that, that memoir is where, yep. where history and fiction meet or something. Yeah, that's okay. actually a really good so, point. So the I question about is, that. Oh, yeah. you might not have heard it. He's asking about um, the comment about history uh, and memory mm -hmm. and wondering your thoughts on memoir because yep. that is sometimes memory. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually a really good question. So, um, Memoir, so, so on a, a straightforward answer is that for me, memoir is representative, right? It's representative, right? So when you write your memoir, first of all, it's, you know, unlike an autobiography, which is like about your entire life, a memoir is about a, a part of your life, right? It was really important. Um, and it's rooted in not so much, and you can include in what you find out later, but most, mostly what drives it is like your perspective, right? Like, you know, what was important to you when you were a kid growing up in that place and during the Troubles or, you know, there's some great memoirs about sort of Northern Ireland, Belfast, right? And so it should be driven by that, right? And you should read it and really feel like you're back then seeing it through your eyes, if it's effective. It shouldn't be a person older telling you about that memory. That would feel not as authentic. And so in that sense, memoir is limited. Um, and oftentimes the, the person will say like, oh, I realized this. At the time, I thought this. And that's OK, similar to what I was saying with fiction. Um, historians who use memoir, I mean, the first thing you're doing with the, with the memoir is saying like, it's like a transcript. Like, this is what the person remembers about what happened, right? But you're judging it as you judge an interview or anything else as a document to be analyzed. What's valuable to historians and why so many, I was telling the, the group that um, I'm taking on is my, my, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be my next historical project, doing a biography of Henry Highland Garnett, who's a black abolitionist and he was the first black person to give a speech at Congress in 1865. He's a huge figure that's not that well known. It's gonna be a commercial book. Why people don't write biographies of people like Garnett is because he didn't leave a memoir. Because a memoir will take you to where they went, even if you can't, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, you, the interpretation. But at least it gives you, like, this person was there. You can go follow there if there's not a lot of papers. And they went to there. And Garnett was in Europe. Then he was in Jamaica in the 1850s. And he was sort of was a missionary. Then he was in West Africa. And, you know, when you have a memoir, the benefit for historians is they can utilize that uh, and follow that. Uh, but it... It's really a different, pro for me, as I said, I've never written a memoir, so I don't know, but for me, it's a very different process, um, and it demands uh, a different set of competencies, and it has a different expectations from you all when you're reading a memoir or a history book about that. Does that answer the question well enough? Yeah. Does it get well, close? I was asking, though, that it seems to me that the memoir writer... Yep. Yep. Yeah. That the memoir also, in a sense, follows the story. And the yep. story that we learn from generations past yep. is always in part fiction, right? So I'm, I'm well, just wondering whether mm -hmm. your view, memoir is where history meets fiction. Yeah, well, yeah. If a memoir is where history meets fiction. Yeah, I know. I think, I think that's a good argument. I think because, you know, what for me, fiction is about intentional creation of stories that didn't happen on purpose in a way that creates effect, right? So there is an effect created by it. So if you want, whatever you want the effect to be, you write that fiction style and you have executed that. Um, and so there's an intentionality in a way. 
uh, effective memoir will feel like it's like I'm just sitting down telling you a story, but it does use that intentionality in terms of being sure you're telling the stories. And this is where editors come in, right? To getting a story that's going to be one that readers will be able to sort of read and, and find to be super compelling. Because all the stories you tell, no matter how good of a storyteller, some are more compelling than others. So. You have any, well, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yep. And how it gets reflected in narratives. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, the question is, uh, is what responsibility does society have to, uh, to, for, for false narrative? Yeah. So I think that in, uh, a person that believes the election is stolen should absolutely write a novel about it. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, you know, that, because it reflects the beliefs of the time period, like all art should, right? So, you know, that's a very viable, now, in terms of responsibility, it's like the biggest debate. And what is the responsibility of the black artist? It was like a huge debate in the 20s, particularly with W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes and others. Um, I do think that, um, personally, my art, art, artistic sort of philosophy um, is one that, you know, when you take something seriously as an artist, realize, and I say this to students, actually, Realize the impact that your work has. And just be sure when you put it out there, not the work you do. You do paintings or whatever. Do everything. Be an artist. But when you put stuff out for public consumption and you want other people to engage your work, just be aware of the impact it has. Because if you write something that is, you know, extraordinarily homophobic, racist, and like, you know, like it's, I'm an artist, like, you know, I'm going to write that. And, I, and my whole view, artistic vision, is like, your responsibility is to your art, but just be aware. Mm -hmm. So this is the big question about the N-word, right? So I had a white student one time, like, yo, professor, man, these guys are on me. I'm like, my character uses the N-word. Like, I don't see why that's a problem. And I'm like, I mean, as an artist, like, it's not. I mean, but you should definitely listen to your, you know, the black women in your class, and you're white, and you're using the N-word in your short stories, and you need to hear what they're saying. And realize, as I said, the impact your work's having. And if that's your intention, and be intentional with your work, it's your work. Like, stand by it. Um, but if really it's not the most important thing for that character to use the N-word, that's part of like editing and, and really rethinking your work. Um, so what's the responsibility for society or community to have art? You know, I think that art reflects the community. We were talking about this about hip hop um, because students really were interested in that question of like, what's the responsibility of rap music? to uplift the community or to perpetuate stereotypes. And, and that's, I said the same thing, like, right? It's just like, you know, the rap artists are rapping about, you know, if it's sexist and homophobic and racist and all that stuff, like, that's the world they're in. They're, they're, they're expressing it. I don't believe they're creating it. I don't think artists create that. I mean, yeah, you could have sci-fi and you could sort of create, like, fictional worlds and things like that. But usually when it's rooted in, like, you know, Bed-Stuy, I was using Biggie Smalls, like, He's rapping about like what he sees in Bed Stuy, and we can be angry that he's saying it, but like, really, like, have you been to Bed Stuy in the in the '80s and seen the drug deal and the hustle and the stuff? Like, because you know, so you know, I'm, you know, I'm an artist. I'm gonna come down on that on that level. So, yep. No. I'm going to duck that question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and the reason I'm going to duck that, that the question was about publisher's Should responsibility. Publisher and it, yeah. I will duck that one um, because I don't want to say anything uh, that is offensive and universal about publishers' choices they make. Um, I will say this, though, that publishers with integrity, whether they're newspaper publishers, they're publishing anything, stand by their work. Mm -hmm. yeah. They stand by their artists. How about so, one more for, question? yeah, yeah please. Right here. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And like with all the activists, like class activists like you know, Davis and Chris Brown, how do you think like this generation, of especially like you know, very young women of color, mm -hmm. how do you think we can um, be activists and yep. with special problems that are happening today? 
The question is about young activists uh, and, and being activists, and especially in white communities. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. First, I would say that um, there is a benefit for young people who are engaged in activism. And one of the things I said to the students is, and I sort of showed them examples of the ways in which you know young people, middle school students, high school students, have actually been central to our social movements. Right. So that's just context. Um, I, I do think there's value in trying to, to learn a bit about the fear, um, the sense that it wouldn't work, that it wouldn't get there from the past. Because if when you begin to study, say, Angela Davis, we were talking about earlier, and you read, you realize that like when you become an activist, you engage. And I actually, I don't consider myself an activist, actually. So sorry if I slipped. My, um, you know, I'm an educator. I see myself as like an engaged educator. Um, but my bar, because I study social moves, maybe, of like being an activist is pretty high. It doesn't mean doing an action, right? It means that you're you know, dedicated to the social movement. Here. So, so I don't consider myself an activist, but I do think that uh, young activists uh, who are doing work, I think it, it's helpful to study the, the challenge, you know, the sort of real history of what it was like in the moments. Because you know, I was teaching about the sit-ins in Greensboro in February uh, in my class last week. And one of what's great that comes out in a documentary, which I had never seen, that came out in the 2000s, and if you read memoirs by people that sat in in Greensboro or sitting in, they, they're like, they didn't have any sense that the outcome would be a mass movement of sitting in. They were students at a and they were, you know, they were seniors, like they were like, we may get kicked out of school. Like, we don't know the outcome, and I think it's helpful because part of the way history is taught, I feel like, is sort of like this inevitability thing where it's like, oh, well, you know, very simple, and of course this happened. And so I think that young actors would benefit by learning about the, how fraught it is to be engaged in social movements, um, but also not to be determined. I actually think there's a lot of, of hope and positivity in, say, in the Black Power Movement and Civil Rights Movement, Black Lives Matter Movement, which you know, young generations initiated. You know, all the older mm -hmm. activists are like coming to them, like, and they're like, get out of the way. Like, <laughs> we're making things happen. And, yeah. and we see this social movement has led to monumental change. I mean, the changes that have happened as a consequence of Black Lives Matter movement are the sorts of changes people have tried to make happen for generations, mm -hmm. for generations. And then we see some of this happening. And so for me, it's a narrative of um, the possibility of activism. Um, and so, you know, I don't have any, I guess, advice, but I do say, do think that um, when you study social movements, you realize that they're fraught with uncertainty and outcomes are not what people think. But sometimes when you get the long arc and you look back, you realize that we accomplished more than what we, you know, what we thought. And I'll give one example. My father was in the movement I mentioned, but he also was a part of founding the Association of Black Social Workers. So he was like actually in that particular moment, like one of the founding people of that. Um, and he never talked about it, uh, ever. And I remember one time, you know, this is again, I started teaching the civil rights movement, and I asked him, I said, Dad, like, why didn't you start telling me these stories about like, you know, what it was like organizing the Association of Black Social Workers? And, and, the, and I was like, Dad, like, why didn't you ever tell me those stories? And he was like, you know, I was trying to forget them. Mm -hmm. Because in his mind, they failed on so many things. The big debate that led to the, a fracture in 73, 74 was over white people adopting black kids. And that was a main, my dad was like a Marxist. Like he was like left. So he really like with the nationalists, like that was a really fraught moment. And like that really led to a lot of hurt feelings and a lot of pain among activists who really were engaged also professionally in social change stuff. Um, and so that's sometimes what happens is that, you know, for him, it was very painful. And, and he really didn't really feel like it necessarily accomplished what he really wanted to accomplish. Um, but I think a lot of us would look back and be like, wow, no, actually, like, there was a lot of positive things accomplished. Um, but sometimes when you're in that moment, it just, you know, as a younger person, maybe in high school, maybe in this school, it's like, dang, we really wanted this and nothing changed. Um, and sometimes just that perspective gives you that sense of like, yeah, well, maybe the next generation comes along, you know, and is involved in, in, in following what you did. Uh, and, and Claudette Colvin, y'all know Claudette Colvin at all? You know, this is like so interesting. So Claudette Colvin was a 15, she sat in before Rosa Parks. And so, and she was, act, but she was actually a student in Rosa Parks thing, so she knew Rosa Parks. But what's interesting is that 
it was like all this time later, someone like knocks on our door. <laughs> and it's like the 2000s, like, are you Claudette Colvin? And she's like, yeah. She's like, are you the one that sat in the four rows of Parks? She's like, yeah, you know, Miss Parks. So, you know, I was, she's like, they're like, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> the long arc of history. And, that, and then there was a children's book. That's why we know about it. There was a children's book written about it. So a generation of young people, they all know my students, they all know Claudette Colvin because the children's book. Right, And so sometimes the long arc of history as a high school student, at the time you didn't get acknowledged for this courageous act of sitting, you know, of sort of you know, challenging segregation. But later on, you know, it doesn't always happen, but you just don't know the impact that you have. And then, of course, the impact that, uh, of course, you know, people now, if they read Claudette Colvin and saw she was a high school student and did this courageous act, uh, realized. So um, that's the positive note maybe we'll end on. I don't know if we're out of time. or. Yeah. Dr. Ishmael Green, thanks so much for being here. Really yeah, no, thank it. you all for coming. <laughs>